Well, if any of you are feeling bad or down, I'll tell you the best way to raise your confidence, best way to feel better about yourselves, is to get in a relationship with a really jealous person. Because <laughs> if you're with somebody who's really jealous, eventually you'll be convinced that everybody wants you. <laughs> it's cool being a comedian. You know, I get I to travel around the world telling jokes. After shows, people say nice things. Sometimes it's great. But I'll tell you, the worst thing you'd say to a comedian is going up to him after a show and being like, hey man, it takes a lot of guts to do that. <laughs> no, seriously, it, it takes a lot of guts. Because to me, that's like saying, hey, at least you tried. <laughs> it's like the participation ribbon of compliments. <laughs> Good times. Anyways, looks like we got some parents here tonight. Maybe some, some grandparents. Maybe some great-grandparents. I don't know. I feel like kids these days get lied to all the time. Right? Kids get lied to all the time, like parents, teachers tell these kids, you're amazing, you're wonderful, you're special. Let's be honest, most of these kids are average at best, <laughs> statistically speaking. Like I was watching this documentary on the state of American education talk about this math test taking my kids from all over the world. American kids placed in the bottom half of this test. You want to know where American kids were number one? In how well they thought they did on the test. <laughs> kids think they're amazing, in actuality not so much. Kids get lied to all the time, like most of us were told, oh, if you get good grades, you'll be successful professionally, right? If you get good grades, you'll be successful in your professional life. We all know that's not true. <laughs> I got good grades my whole, my whole life, and I went to high school with this guy named Adam Levine. I don't know if you've heard of him. <laughs> Lead singer of his band, Maroon 5, judge on that show, The Voice. Yeah, he was a great ahead of me, because uh, I did so well in school. We had a couple classes together. We had Spanish together, Algebra 2 together. Pretty sure I got much better grades than him in those classes. Now, he's a multimillionaire selling out arenas all over the world. I'm performing for 50 people in Provo on a Friday night. <laughs> but I told him, I said, Adam, you could have the Grammys. One day I'm gonna rock my very own dry bar comedy special, baby. <laughs> Thanks to you all tonight, I'm living the dream, people. The dream has come true tonight. <laughs> Thank you, my few supporters, I appreciate you. I don't want to boast or brag to you lovely people, but I'll let you know right now you're looking at a man who is undefeated in spelling bees. This one dude likes literacy. Yeah. Two-time San Fernando Valley spelling bee champion. That's right, I successfully defended my title. Do you want to know how many times in my adult life my spelling skills have helped me? Do you want to take a guess at that? Take a gander, if you will. One, you are optimistic, sir. <laughs> Zero is the correct answer. I had no idea I was learning to spell these words. In a few years, everyone would just rely on something called spell check. <laughs> a waste of time. There might, actually, there might have been once in my adult life, my spelling skills helped me. It might have been once uh, I was able to impress this hot Polish woman by correctly spelling her last name. <laughs> and then she dated my friend. Hard knock life, man. It's hard out there. <laughs> That's what I said. <laughs> study relationships, because all mine have failed, so I'm trying to learn. And I was reading about this one study done by a group of Harvard economists, and they determined the number one factor that determines whether or not a relationship will be successful. Anyone have any idea what it is? Of course not. <laughs> It's something called positive illusion. What that means is if you want your relationship to be successful, you have to view your significant other as better than that person actually is. <laughs> so a lot of times you hear people say, I don't know what she sees in him, or I don't know what he sees in her. They see some stuff that doesn't actually exist. <laughs> and that's why they're happy. We're learning, people. It's educational. Good times, everyone. 
Thank you, one person clapping, killing this. Here we go, yes. Also saw this study, talked about the number one factor that shows whether or not your significant other will cheat on you. You know what that is? Attractiveness. The more attractive your partner is, the more likely that person will be to cheat on you. Isn't that messed up? That means if you want to be in a successful relationship with somebody that won't cheat on you, all you have to do is find an ugly person who you think is beautiful. Thank you, universe, for making it so easy. Terrible, man. Actually, it's true. My, my last girlfriend, she, she was actually a radical feminist, which is interesting. I told my buddy I was dating a radical feminist. He's like, oh, that's great. Whenever you went out to eat, she must have always bought her own food. <laughs> no. She was a radical feminist, and there is a difference between a feminist and a radical feminist. A feminist will buy her own dinner. A radical feminist will say that you owe her dinner because men make more money than women do. <laughs> There's my gold digging girl. Get it. Get it, bud. There's actually one huge advantage of dating a radical feminist, though, and that is her expectations of me couldn't have been any lower. Because when I mess stuff, I'm like, well, I'm a dude. What you gonna do? You're not that great. You know it. Come on. Thank you, one chick clapping. Here we go. Killing this. I notice after you reach a certain age, people try to convince you you need to be in a relationship, right? And it's like, I've always been open to relationships, but the sales pitch for relationships is terrible. It's awful. Like, people would come up to me and be like, Justin, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna have fun forever? <laughs> yeah, pretty much, that's a plan. <laughs> Implication there is that the start of the relationship is the end of fun. <laughs> this is what you get the most, though, when people try to convince you you need to be in a relationship, right? Be like, don't you wanna settle down? Aren't you ready to settle down? <laughs> no. Let's look at the phrase, settle down. The first word is settled. <laughs> Not only are we settling, we're settling down. Yeah, we're moving down. If I wanna settle, I wanna settle up. I don't wanna settle down. Now some of you are laughing, and some of you this joke is way too real. <laughs> you get it, thank you, Sex in the City Provo Edition, I hear you. Anyways. <laughs> I got a problem with our laws. I think our criminal justice system is messed up, messed up. Like, I think there should be a law that if you're falsely accused of a crime, you should legally be allowed to do whatever you were wrongfully accused of. <laughs> Some guy goes to the cops, falsely accuses you of theft, you should be allowed to raid his house while he watches you. It's only fair. I'm from LA, a lot of cities in Southern California are now making it illegal for you to smoke cigarettes outside. Like on the sidewalk or on the beach, it's already illegal if you smoke in any indoor establishment in California. It means it's legal to smoke, it's just against the law to do it inside or outside. <laughs> Thanks, big brother, appreciate that. I notice when people talk about addictions, addictions they talk about most are like drinking, illegal drugs. But I'll tell you guys, the most dangerous addiction of all is a gambling addiction. <laughs> Someone's got a problem. Because gambling's the only addiction that can make you rich. And you're only called a gambling addict if you're a terrible gambler. If you're good at gambling, you're called a professional. Gambling's the only addiction where your proficiency is tied to whether or not you're an addict. Like if you're really good at doing drugs, nobody calls you a rock star. Just a crackhead, come on. <laughs> Next joke, good times. <laughs> I like sports, man, but I'll be honest. Sometimes I think in this country, people take football a little too serious, a little too seriously, right? Yeah. They're my non-sports fans, yes. <laughs> Go Cougars. <laughs> I meant that kind. Anyways. <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> sometimes I think people take football a little too seriously, like, a few years ago, I was watching the, football, the college football playoffs and Alabama was playing and they lost. And after the game, they showed the stands, they showed college students from Alabama crying. I'm like, uh, that is gross. <laughs> You're crying because you lost a football game? 
The only reason you should be crying is because you're from Alabama. <laughs> Win or lose, you gotta go back to Tuscaloosa. It'll take a lot of sweet tea to drown those tears. Come on. I like sports. I get annoyed by the broadcasters because I feel like they always use the same lines, the same cliches, right? Like in football, when a player scores a touchdown, does like the celebratory dance. A lot of times you hear the announcers go, oh my gosh, that was a classless display. That was classless. I'm like, really? This is a game where people knock each other out and break their necks. You're talking about class? Uh, this is not the opera or a beauty pageant. I know if I played football, I scored a touchdown, and I was still alive, I'd want to do a dance too. What's up? Hey, touchdown. Thank you, same girl. Anyways, this is... <laughs> I've been following this politics stuff, and I don't get it all, but I notice a lot of candidates are talking about bringing programs that they do in other countries here. Like, they've been talking about socialized medicine, paid maternity leave, paid paternity leave. Maybe. Uh, but I think there's one thing they do in other countries that we need here, and nobody's talking about that. You know what we need here? We need siestas. So tonight, I am announcing my super pack called Americans for Siestas. Feel free to join. Get on board, it's gonna be hot. Now, some of you are applauding, some of you are on board, some of you don't know what a siesta is. On various countries across the world, they have this thing called a siesta where it is against the law to work from 2 to 5 p.m. You have to eat, drink, and take a nap. Imagine how amazing it would be if we had that here. You could go up to your boss at 1.59 p.m. and be like, I love to keep working, sir, but I'm a law-abiding citizen. Gotta go, bro. <laughs> how great would that be? And I was doing some research for this joke, and, and, I, and I found out one of the countries that has siestas is Mexico. And there's been a lot of talk about keeping Mexican immigrants out by building a big wall on the border. Uh, we don't need to do all that. All we need is to have a big sign down there that says, no siestas a key. <laughs> People are just like, oh, forget that, I'm going home. <laughs> I love a siesta, <laughs> I, I like that joke because it's kind of political without being political. Because I try not to talk about politics too much on stage because politics divides people, right? I don't want to talk about things that bring us together, like our hatred of the politicians. <laughs> my brother actually uh, worked in politics. My brother used to work for Congress, right? Uh, it's weird being a professional comedian and having the more respectable job. <laughs> Spicy. Anyways. <laughs> I love my brother, he actually, he got married, he has a couple kids, so because of him, I'm an uncle. And uh, being an uncle is great. Like, people told me before I became an uncle, like, oh, best part about being an aunt, uncle, grandparent, is you can play with the kids, have fun with them, but then when they get annoying, you just give those kids back. <laughs> and that is absolutely true, that is amazing. But to me, that's not the best part about being an uncle. To me, the best part about being an uncle is when it comes to my niece and nephew, I can be really proud of their accomplishments, but I can also be really happy to know that I'm not responsible for their failures. It ain't my fault. <laughs> and I think about like being a parent of what I would do if I had kids, and I decided, you know what, I'm never gonna hit my kids, I'm not gonna spank my children. Because the way I look at it, if you can't discipline your kids through bribery and ridicule, then you're not smart enough to have kids. Thank you for the four golf claps. Love ya. Get it, Justin. Anyways. <laughs> you guys are fun. This is cool. <laughs> One of the biggest thrills of my comedy career, I've actually been able to do uh, four tours overseas for the troops, which is pretty cool. Uh, actually performed in Afghanistan, which was fun. And uh, three weeks before I performed in Afghanistan, I, uh, I shot a gun for the very first time. Uh, because I grew up in, in L.A. where you're not even allowed to have toy guns. Uh, a super soaker is considered a gateway gun. Can't do that. So I go and I perform in Afghanistan, right? Three weeks after having shot a gun for the very first time, Special Forces decides to take me to the weapons range and they let me shoot a grenade launcher. So three weeks after having never shot a gun, 
I'm shooting a grenade launcher. What's up now? And I was, I've, never felt, I've never felt so hardcore in my life after shooting that grenade launcher, right? So I'm feeling good. I feel like testosterone's flowing. I'm like, yeah, who's the man? <laughs> then the special forces guy, he had an ATV there, right? And so he told me to get on the ATV. He's like, get on this ATV. I'm like, okay. We're in Afghanistan, middle of nowhere. Drives me to middle of nowhere on this base, desolate, all desert. He stops the ATV. He says, get off the ATV. I'm like, say what? <laughs> You can't really argue with special forces in Afghanistan. So I get off the ATV. He's like, go stick your hand through that barbed wire fence. I'm like, what? He's like, do it. I'm like, okay, because you can't really argue with special forces in Afghanistan. So I go, walk over there, slowly stick my arm through the fence. He's like, okay, now come back over. So I walk back over there. He looks me dead in the eye, super serious. And he says, now you can say you've been in a war zone. So, I don't want to brag to you guys, but people, I fought for our country. <laughs> and I was unarmed, thank you. What? I, was, I feel like we still live in a very macho society, macho culture, like there's this whole concept of being a real man, right? Guys are like, I'm a real man, I'm a real man. You hear women go, I just want a real man. I just want a real man. <laughs> I mean, a real man, what does that mean? That means you're just good at uh, building stuff and killing stuff. And by that definition, I'm very much an artificial man. Right now, you're looking at the sweet and low of dudes. The splenda of guys. Full of aspartame. Get it? It's nutritious. Here we go. Love you guys. Man, I, I got cool, interesting friends, but some of them are weird, man. I got some weird friends, too. Like, I have friends that run marathons for fun. No. There is nothing fun about that. Like, once a decade, I'll run at most a mile, and when I'm done, I'm not like, you know, it'd be a blast doing that 25.2 more times. <laughs> My friends who run marathons, like, they all do for different reasons, but uh, none, none of them are good reasons. No, no, like one of my friends is like, you know what, I did it to raise money for charity. I did it to raise money for charity. I'm like, you realize you could do that without running a marathon. <laughs> my other friend's like, I just wanted to challenge myself. I just wanted to challenge myself. I'm like, then why don't you try a really high level of Candy Crush? <laughs> Maybe Bejeweled Blitz, get crazy with it. I feel like the marathon thing, it's an elitism thing. It's like people go around being like, look at me, I ran a marathon. I ran a marathon. <laughs> like the same people that will judge you for eating a McDonald's french fry. <laughs> Have you come across those people? They're like, I can't believe you put that in your body. <laughs> like, how could you put that fry in your body? Do you know that fry has the same chemicals as rat poison? <laughs> the fry has the same chemicals as rat poison. I'm like, really? Well, then I'm going to Costco and stocking up on rat poison. Because the fry is delicious. My other friend's like, do you know that fry has additives that are banned in every other country? That fry has additives that are banned in all the other countries? I'm like, well, maybe that's why we're the military superpower. The secret is in our chemicals. We're like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. The other countries are just turtles, but we're heroes in a half shell. Turtle power, baby. That's a silly joke. Thanks for being on board. Appreciate you guys. Good times. A lot of people get surprised when they, when they find this out about me, but I actually speak Spanish. Um, I learned Spanish as a teenager from uh, listening to Selena songs. Uh, not Selena Gomez, Selena Quintanilla, the real Selena. Okay, the Tejano singer, okay? Thank you, one fan she has, yes. Rest in peace, Selena. It's weird looking like me and going around singing Selena, because I have friends that, you know, rock out to hip hop, to maybe some people some emo alternative music, and I'm going around going, No me queda más. Que perderme en abismo de tristeza. Bidi bidi bum bum. Se emociona. No, anyways, this is a thing. <laughs> Yeah, get it, Justin. You guys didn't like that one, but this is the thing. It's okay, it's okay. You can get Rosetta Stone, it's all good. But this is the thing, people. 
I learned Spanish from Selena's songs. I also learned Spanish from uh, watching Spanish TV. And one thing I learned from watching Spanish TV is how direct Latin culture is. Like so much more direct than mainstream American culture. Like there's this one show on Spanish TV called El Gordo y la Flaca. <laughs> Loosely translated to the fat guy and the skinny chick. <laughs> Hosted by a fat guy and a skinny chick. I was like, whoa, that's amazing. Because like in mainstream American culture, no matter how big someone gets, like you're not supposed to call them fat. In Latin culture, you get big enough, they change your name to fatty. <laughs> it's crazy. I'll tell you, it is a blessing to be doing this comedy thing. It's a blessing to be here, especially because the last few years I had some health problems. I had a couple surgeries. Uh, people, actually I actually had my colon removed. My colon is gone. Ah. And, uh, <laughs> Those of you that know nothing about human biology, the colon is like pretty important in the whole digestion and pooping process. But thanks to a good surgeon, some luck, we're good, everything functions right, you know? Hey. When you go through something like that, yeah, you appreciate life a lot more, but after you go through something like that, you no longer have a lot of sympathy for the insignificant complaints of other people. No more sympathy. Like shortly after I got out of the hospital, my second surgery, my friend calls me up. She's like, Justin, I had the worst day ever. I'm like, really, what happened? She's like, oh my gosh, I went to the movies, right? And I wanted to see Star Wars for so long. And I got there an hour early. And when I got there, it was all sold out. I'm like, what? You couldn't see Star Wars? Well, I don't have a colon. <laughs> No colon is now my response every time someone whines to me about something stupid. My other friend's like, man, I got a parking ticket, my life's over. I'm like, one parking ticket, no colon, I win again. <laughs> and when I was really sick, I was on all these prescription medications with potentially crazy side effects like tumors, tuberculosis, lymphoma. And none of these drugs helped me out, none of these drugs made me feel better. I'll be honest, the only drug that helped me out, helped my symptoms, was this drug known as marijuana. Yeah. Oh, I didn't expect that applause in Utah. All right, <laughs> outed yourselves. And for this reason, I'm a big supporter of medicinal marijuana because it helps me, right? So shortly before my first surgery, I go to this family wedding. Parents are there, brother, cousins, everyone there, and people were worried about me. So I go up to my mom, I'm like, mom, to be honest, I started smoking marijuana and it makes me feel better. So my mom, bless her heart, at this family wedding, she starts going table to table asking people if they have marijuana for me. She's like, hi, my son doesn't feel well. Do you have marijuana? Justin sick, do you have marijuana? Lo and behold, one of my cousins has a joint in his pocket. He pulls me outside, we start smoking this joint together. At this point, I don't know whether to be depressed or proud that my mom has become my weed supplier. <laughs> now it's a few years later, I am proud. Give it up for my mommy, people. That's a good mama. I'll tell you guys, uh, before, I, before I actually uh, started doing this comedy thing, I was actually a gymnast. I was on the gymnastics team when I was in college. Thank you. <laughs> Some people think I'm lying when I say I was a gymnast. Uh, what dude lies about being a gymnast? <laughs> None of you care. Really, I'm only doing this comedy thing until I can win America Ninja Warrior. That's the real <laughs> <laughs> But I feel like some of you doubt me. I will, I will prove it to you that I was a gymnast. Check this out. Yeah, now who's impressive? <laughs> when you're a gymnast, though, people say weird things to you, give you weird compliments. Like I told this one woman I was a gymnast, and she's like, oh, if you ever get into a fight, you could just break out your gymnastics. <laughs> no, you can't do that. Like if some big burly guy's ready to brawl, I can't be like, hey, back up, man. <laughs> just back it up, bro, just back that up. You don't want to mess with this right here, or you'll be in danger. 
All right, so guys, I'm done. My name is Justin. Have a lovely night. Thank you. Appreciate you guys. Thank you. Hi, thanks so much for watching my Dry Bar comedy special. I greatly appreciate it. Hope you laughed and chuckled a bit. And if you did, I would even more greatly appreciate a financial contribution to the Justin Berkman Fund so that one day I may be able to buy some beef jerky without feeling guilty. Thank you.